Und weiter geht es hier auf unserer Bühne hier bei Tamron. Schön, dass ihr alle da seid. Es geht jetzt hier weiter mit Maxim Guselnikov. Und äh, Maxim äh, kommt aus Russland, äh, zieht seine Inspiration überwiegend aus Filmen und erzählt äh, ganz, ganz tolle Stories mit seinen Bildern, die teils ähm, ja, sehr, sehr aufwendig gestaltet sind, sehr, sehr äh, verdichtete Motive, die er hier zeigen wird. Und das Ganze wird auf Englisch äh, präsentiert. So I'm gonna switch to English, just so you know, we're gonna have our next Uh, um, f photographer here on stage from Russia, and I'd like to bring him up with a big round of applause. Here is Maxim Guzelnikov. <laughs> Maxim. Hello. Great to have you. I just kind of explained it in German, what you basically do with your pictures. I assume every photographer out there likes to tell the story with their picture. But yeah. the thing is, when you look at your pictures, they leave They leave so much space for interpretation. It's not. It's like they have an open end, an open beginning. Um, you could basically there are always two sides, or even more sides to it. Um, yeah. So, where do you take your inspiration from? Well, mostly I get my inspiration from movies. I have to say because you know I think that when you're starting, it's quite good to be inspired by the photogra photography. But I think the main you know huge leap in my creative. I don't know, development uh, happened when I started to look more into the movies or digital art or paintings. So I started to understand because, you know, usually when you compare photography to movies, for example, the uh, amount of effort that put to create a scene is much, much, much bigger. So there's so many professionals around to create this, some particular scene. Yeah, and for example, painters, why they are good? Because they are creating worlds, why we have to deal with the reality, sometimes boring reality. We're really excited to see what you've brought along with you, so I'm going to leave the stage to you. I'll be Thank back you. afterwards. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Again, I'm Maxim Guselnikov. I came from Moscow, Russia. And today I'm going to tell you about this available light portraiture with natural light. So, coming from its name, you clearly understand that I'm shooting portraits. But the main thing is that I'm not considering a portrait only just, you know, the picture of a face to show the personality. I consider it more like a, you know, a storytelling scene that can be set and you can show so many details and tell such a great story uh, that, you know, will stand out from the crowd. Because nowadays, you know, a lot of portraits, they are usually like, uh, you know, classical, academical, type of portraits which are usually a close-ups of a person's face or maybe waist portraits but I tried to take to the next level and today I'm going to share with you my knowledge about this particular kind of portrait so um, here's the set of some of my pictures and with each and every one of them I try to tell a story so it may be simple one it may be complicated but again I think I'm strongly you know kind of reassured that every photography, every photograph should ha tell a story about a person, about a moment in time, about a scene, about an atmosphere on some particular scene, about all at once. And the more effort you're putting into this, the better results you're getting. So let's proceed and I'll give you a short, brief uh, wrap up of what we'll be talking today. So first thing is tools, of course, you need to take photos with something we'll be talking about some gear that you need for such a portrait second one is the story of course the story as I told you is very important and um, I'll try to tell you how I bring my ideas to life because usually this creative process the creative development is so under the hood that nobody tells how it works so today I will reveal you how at least I'm doing it myself Next one th is light. Of course, light is very important. So today I'll be uh, discussing with some lighting options and how to deal with natural light because it's actually a very versatile kind of light. And we'll close up with the color. And in the end, I'll show you how it, everything puts together, how you can get the picture, you know, the perfect picture. So all this stuff, we need to bring our ideas to life. So I think you'll understand a bit more about it during today's lecture. But let's first un try to understand what is environmental portrait. You know, usually we consider a portrait just a picture of a face, right? So we see the personality, we see the person, we kind of see the beauty of, let's say, young woman or the 
I don't know, the weathered face of some old man or just man. But it's not only about personality. You know, you can show personality not only by showing face, but the showing the environment of some person, where he or she belongs to. So by adding environment, we're adding another layer of, the sto of depth of the story. So for example, let's take it to the next level and let's do from the other side, vice versa. So for example, you're having very nice scenery, uh, very cool landscape or architecture or something else. What if we put a person within this frame? Will it tell a totally different story? Will it somehow enrich it with the details and show at the same time, you know, cool scene with some person in it and that making us wonder how do this person get there, what will wait for him in the future, and so on. Or for example, from the other side again, how this person appeared here and what's his backstory. So don't be afraid, mix it up. Mix it up, try different stuff, and try to take it to the next level. But uh, because you, when you're connecting the character to some particular scene, you're making your image much, much stronger. So this is a very good thing, but again, you can focus more on the subject, on focus more on the uh, some particular landscape or indoor space. But you need to keep in mind that uh, you need something with which you're going to focus on. And this is your tools, your toolbox, your lenses, your gear. So because I think that the lenses you're using, they are reflect your creative vision. Uh, whoops. So uh, a lot of people using only uh, telephoto lenses for portraits, and it's, you know, like some classical school, some lenses considered like 85, a classical default portrait lenses. But, you know, I don't consider it uh, classical stuff. I shoot with wide angles as well, and here's the contents of my bag. So I have five lenses, super wide angle, 15 to 30 f2.8. I have SP 1.8. VC, all of them are Tamron lenses, of course. Third one is SP45 f1.8, 85 1.8, and 70 to 200 f2.8 VC G2. So the main reason I'm using those lenses is that they deliver incredible image quality while being very compact and light. And all of them have built-in vibration compensation system. So in the situation when you're especially shooting with natural light and it may constantly change and you'll get a little bit different settings, sometimes you have to use longer shutter speeds. So in this case, vibration compensation usually helps. So just some short examples of each and every focal length or lens that I'm using. Uh, usually, people don't take portraits with uh, super wide angle or wide angle lenses, but you know, I don't think that you need exactly be so strict that you're using some particular lens where it, you know, kind of exactly belong. You can experiment, you can try different things, you can be creative as possible. So this shot was made on 15 millimeters with 15 to 30 f 2.8 lens, and again. You can use those uh, perspective warp, this distortion, in a creative way. You don't have to kind of be classical or you don't have to be kind of strict to the standards of something that I think constantly changes. For example, um, let's like, look at the elder brother of the photography's cinematography. Uh, they were using wide angle since forever. And for example, in this particular image, you can use wide angle to show the huge space behind the person because, the, because of the perspective. You can see much, much bigger picture of uh, what's behind the person. You can play with the size. You can play with the, this uh, perspective work and use it on purpose. So why not use it on purpose? Especially if you're shooting something which, in this case, kind of showing some sort of craziness and delusion and maybe um, you know, may have a double meaning. So in this particular case, I think that wide angles, super wide angle lenses, they are pretty cool to reflect your creative vision. So 
don't be afraid. Um, you know, m you may be skeptical about it. I was as well. So, but then I started to, to try it once again and again and again. And in the end, I figured out how, how it works. Because, for example, some of the most iconic shots in the movie history were made with the super wide angles. For example, if you're into Quentin Tarantino movies, just remember that in almost every movie they have this trunk scene when camera is shooting with super wide angle from downwards up. And you know, in Reservoir Dogs, um, uh, Pulp Fiction, and almost every movie that Quentin Tarantino made was, ma uh, was using this super wide angle lenses. But let's move on. The next one is 35 millimeter lens, which is actually became some sort of a um, default wide angle in almost every creative photographer's bag in recent years. Um, I like the balance between the amount of space that you can picture with such a lens and the amount of background separation. So this is a, a perfect balance to me. Like at the same time, you can show the interesting space, but still focus on your subject. For example, in this marble hall in uh, Linz, Austria, I focused on the model, but still showed a lot of space around her. And even you know, when you're using wide angles, the cool thing is that you can be very creative with your composition. So as you can see here, I put her in a frame within a frame. So while be using something like 85 or 70 to 200, it's almost impossible because the perspective, it's got us squeezed and, and more, much, much more tight. So you can be so creative and precise with your composition. So again, 35 millimeter lens, it's a must have in your camera bag. Next one is 45 millimeter lens, which I consider is related to the group of 50 millimeter lenses. Uh, which is again a classical focal length and I think you could str I strongly suggest you to have one because yeah There is much less perspective warp. There is a much more background blur But yet still if we're talking about 45 millimeter lens Some of you may consider it a bit too close in terms of focal length to a 35 but the cool, good thing that I like about this particular Tamron lens is that the you know the distortion and uh, is very almost negligible and all the vertical lines they are uh, they are very upright and straight so because of that the image is really differs from what you have with even with some 50 millimeter lenses and you can see the clear difference between 35 and 45 next one is 85 millimeter lens this is yeah classical focal length and you can kind of focus on your subject and completely blur out the background. And yes, it may be usable, especially if you want to show some bigger spaces. If you have enough space to get far, far, far away from your model, uh, focus on her and show the, you know, some big, nice scenery. But at the same time, if you're somehow a bit got into not so big area, a shooting area, uh, then you can get rid of all the unwanted stuff, blur it out, or just exclude it because of the narrower viewing angle by you know, again, composing your image the way that this unwanted stuff just wouldn't be included in your picture. But uh, mostly I use 85 millimeter lens to concentrate on the headshots, on the classical portraits. But again, you can even shot the environmental portraits with the 85. Just as well as with 70 to 200, which is actually a very versatile lens. And um, you can go on like for with any focal length with any particular shooting scenario like again on 2000 millimeters the perspective is really cool and the background blur getting like very three dimensional kind of showing you the separation from the background but keep in mind i already told you that with 85 millimeter you have to have you have to you know kind of have some really really big spaces but with 200 millimeters i think you have like giant enormous spaces to shoot with so um, you can otherwise concentrate more on the very tight close-up headshots with this lens. And again, even compared with 85, very bright and fast 1.8 lens, it is on 200 millimeters something really different and shows perspective the different way. So again, while you're using a huge variety of lenses, you can shift between them, you can switch between them. And within a series of images, and I usually shot some kind of a series, um, 
you can create totally different images. Some of them will be focusing on the space on which you are shooting some location. The other ones will be concentrating more on the subject. And again, you need to understand and clearly figure out for yourself which one goes for some particular thing. And again, feel free to experiment. We're not here to follow some sort of the rules, because sometimes breaking rules is creating another rule. So don't be afraid and try it out. But from the gear, we're getting to another very big and important thing, which is the story. And as I already told you, I prefer to show some sort of a story in almost every image series that I'm creating. And the story, it's like a puzzle. It's getting piece by piece from small and big parts. And finally, it creates some very interesting and informative image. So actually, how do you adding the story to image? You're just throwing in some additional content, like small details, accessories, decoration, showing connection between the character that you're shooting and the location that you're working with. So the more details you're throwing in, the more complex, the more interesting, the more content-filled your image will become. And again, it's a good thing, because you can always balance the amount of the info like you can squeeze into your frame. Sometimes you can throw in much bigger amount of details. Sometimes it will be smaller amount of details. But again, playing around with it, trying to put it piece by piece will help you to develop your own perception of what is storytelling within your images. You may consider that you know um, it is very complicated to get to that. And it's really kind of almost impossible if you're not ex an expert, if you're not the uh, very highly qualified photographer. But I have to say, I w was there as well. Uh, I didn't know how to make a first step. But you know, I figured out how it works. You know, I had, uh, I think, a few dozens of such shootings, commercial, uh, creative, and all other ones. So I can clearly tell you that it is not so hard. It is actually quite simple. You just need to follow these steps. And I'll tell you about each and every one of them. You just need to follow them. And you know, maybe not from the first time, but from the second, from the third you'll start to see how it works and how it puts together and how it bring your ideas to life. So as I already told you, and as you see, there is a six steps. So first one is get inspired. And just as I already told our presenter, I'm getting inspired by the movies. I'm getting inspired by the digital art. I'm getting inspired by all kinds of different stuff. Because you know it's totally different to photography. And uh, I think. Photographers should be diverse in terms of visual content that they are consuming. You know, it's like the um, learning vocabulary or, for example, alphabet. At first, you learn how to pronounce and write down letters. Then you're putting letters into words. Then you're putting words into sentences. And finally, with the sequence of sentences, you can tell a story. So discovering and um, developing your own creative view is a really lot like that. So the more diverse and the more good visual content you're consuming, the better you will become in bringing your ideas to life. Next one is do research. And it's actually quite easy and quite understandable because you know the uh, research is the ground before making your first step. You need to be sure that there is a ground to step on. So research is this ground. So just Google for the particular location, for this idea, for this theme, for the photo shooting that you want to bring to life. Um, try to search for maybe some pictures that were already made in the same style, maybe with the same idea. For example, you decided to go for Red Riding Hood. And there is hundreds of shootings of Red Riding Hood uh, out in the internet. Of course, try to get some information about the location, about the styling, about the clothes, about some maybe uh, accessories and other stuff that you will need. So feel free to kind of dedicate yourself fully to this search because you know the more thing you know prior to the shoot, the more you are prepared. But we will get to this a bit later as well. Next one is pick right model. And of course, you know if you're into portrait photography, you need to be very cautious and very generous with selecting and picking the models. 
because the model is the main actor, let's say, in your movie. And for example, if you're having everything is set right and clear, and then you're getting the wrong kind of a model, then everything ruins. It's just not working. Just, for example, uh, imagine that we're having the same set, like all the professionals, like cameraman, director, uh, decorators, locations and stuff of the Mission Impossible movie. But the main role is played by Rowan Atkinson, Mr. Bean. It's not working, right? And vice versa. The same Mr. Bean scenery, but with uh, Tom Cruise in the main role, dressed up, sharp looking. It's not working neither this way nor the other. So picking the right model may be uh, very essential for you. So usually you have to get some sort of the um, selection of the models that you already work with or you want to work with, with whom you're going to discuss this creative idea and they will decide work with you or not. But again, dedicate yourself and try to find the right person, right model for your shooting. Next is take care about stuff. And what I mean here is that, yeah, sad to admit it, but if you're not controlling everything, you're not the director of your shooting. You have to recheck everything after the other part of, or member of your team. You have to recheck weather, you have to recheck, you know, transportation, you have to recheck everything because when you're taking care about stuff, you're keeping the situation and the whole shooting under your control. If not, then everything may happen. Next one is be aware. And by be aware, I mean that you have to be really adaptive and versatile because sometimes things may change, sometimes things may totally change, like something may fail on you, and you have to perceive it, you know, be prepared, because once in a while it may save your shooting. So, in this case, be always prepared for that. And last one, but not least, of course, is analyze results. Because, uh, because if you're not analyzing what you're doing, if, even if you're doing it right, you're not understanding which aspects of your shooting style and your shooting concepts or shooting techniques may be improved. There's always room to grow. So again, don't hesitate and analyze res your results with every shooting especially if you're kind of trying to take it to the next level and do some sort of a huge photo project with storytelling series of images. If we decide to kind of visualize this creative process, then you'll see that it's actually, again, a very strict and transparent sequence of movements and steps you need to make, which will finally bring you to the wanted result. So first, of course, is the inspiration. As I said, without an inspiration, you could even go any further. So get inspired by something. Next one is create a mood board. This is strongly related to the research that I already mentioned. And create a mood board and images of images and details you're getting as a basis to create thing that is called semantic field. Semantic field is, let's say, the set of images and elements that even without showing you the final result will immediately make you think about this. Next one is scouting. Again, spend your time on scouting for a model. Spend your time for scouting for a uh, landscape. Again, even maybe go to this particular um, location and see for yourself how it works like. Because you know, some th one thing is looking for, um, let's say, some photographs of, uh, of other photographers. And totally different is when you're get, uh, getting there and you're trying to work there itself. Because looking on photographers and working on some particular location may be totally different thing and totally hell, I have to say. Then after that, styling in clothes comes. So you need to understand how to style your model, which clothes, which clothes you're going to use, how to style, would you go for a makeup artist or no? Would you change the hair or no? But again, be prepared. And if you have a very nice team of professionals that may help you, a friend of yours, or maybe just the professionals that you can hire, go for it. Because you learn a lot from working with them. Next one is location. Again, when you are already picked some particular location, go there and look for yourself how it looks in the same particular time of the day when you're shooting. So because, you know, and, and, and search for the perfect spot. 
So then do all the preparation. Be aware that all kinds of urgent situations may come and always have a plan B. And in the end, you'll get the results you want to. So again, it's just a simple sequence of steps you need to follow. And believe me, maybe not from the first time, but from the second or third, you start to getting it right. So the more repeats you're getting, the better the process gets and the more fluent you become with this process. But let's move on to the light, because light is the most important thing. Yeah, you know, because photography means like capturing light. And natural light is, is uh, the kind of light that I'm using uh, since I, uh, I think since I decided to go for this kind of portraiture, I was shooting with natural light because I like that it reflects the atmosphere, it reflects the moment, it, it directly transfers the light mood into your picture. And you just couldn't mimic it with any kind of artificial lights. So that's what I'm using, natural light. And there is a different characters of natural light. For example, it may be soft and diffused, it may be directed harsh sunlight, or it may be muted light, like during twilight. Or, for example, totally different and a very balanced light with pronounced color temperature, like on sunset or sunrise. And in each and every case, you're getting totally different kind of light, which will enrich your image with some really cool light mood. And you'll get, again, some very special atmosphere in your scene. Of course, mastering the natural light will take some time, because you know a lot of people think that natural light is easy to handle, but actually it isn't. And at the same time, it is when you understand natural light, you are be very cautious about controlling it. So you can take it under control, even in so very stressful situations. And the more you'll be shooting with natural light, the more you'll get into very challenging situations, the more creative and experimental you're going to get with this natural light. So again, the more you're shooting with it, the more different kinds and characters of natural light you're trying, the better you'll become, the more you master the natural light. So the biggest advantage for me of using natural light is the amplifying the atmosphere, because you just couldn't couldn't recreate something like a sunset with uh, artificial lights, right? Artificial lights were made to simulate natural light when it's not available, right? So such very, uh, let's say, nature's special effects, they're very useful and you are kind of get very unique pictures by using this. So again, if you think that this, some partic this particular kind of natural light is very appropriate in, during your shooting, go for it, plan your shooting, and get at the right time, at the right spot. But at the same time, you can mix the natural light with some artificial lights, like uh, indoor ambient light, or maybe some constant light, or flashes. It is very versatile. You can mix it up in different proportions, like making the natural light the main source, or maybe the secondary source, like a rim light or something like this. Again, it is it adds another layer, another set of possibilities. So if you're kind of mixing the natural light with uh, something else, again, you're getting a huge set of possibilities. But let's get to the final part of this, let's say, set of things that you need to have under control. And this is the color. Um, as I know, a lot of people consider color the part of the post-processing, not the shooting process. But I have to say, since I started to dedicate myself to picking the right colors for the shooting, I mean combining the colors of the model's outfit and the location, my understanding of color, my sensitivity for color improved a lot. Because when you understand how uh, light mixing up and how, uh, how color mixing up, how it works. You start to um, put everything together by yourself and you're no longer relying to Photoshop or maybe some other things that you need to kind of set your colors right. If you're picking working color scheme prior to the shooting, I think that 95% you'll get like color results that you want. Uh, so to use the color right, you just need to follow to such things as color schemes. And there is four of them, and I will tell you about each and every one of them. First one is analog color scheme. 
This is when the, your colors are really close to each other. For example, here we have a set of really warm tones. They are a little bit different in hues. They're a little bit different in the saturation or in brightness. But again, it, they put together very nicely. And as you see the model's outfit, her skin tone, her hair color, and the location, they are fits perfectly well. So this is how the analog color scheme works. Next one is complementary. And usually, complementary goes for the opposite colors on the color wheel. So when you're picking the colors which are opposed one to the other. Here we have a set of really saturated orange reds and very cool uh, kind of Tokyo's blues on the background. So again, in this case, you have the effect of which is called color contrast, which usually um, appears as that the subject of the opposite color kind of pops from the background. And you can easily see it here. Next one is triangle color scheme. It, there is three main colors, usually. They are, don't have to be like evenly um, be distributed across the frame. So one may be a dominant, like greens here, so the biggest part of the image is green. Then the blue is supportive color, and the color accent is warm orange, which is placed on our model. So again, they are subtle, they are pastel, I may say it. But again, the scheme is clearly seen, and it works. And last but not least is double complementary, when you're picking two sets of opposite colors and put them all together. Also, it may be called like cross complementary or square color scheme. So we have here, for example, reds opposed to the greens and yellows opposed to the blues. Again, double complementary, complementary set of one colors, complementary set of the other. And when you're kind of trying to understand how to put this thing together, you just, again, as I said, just sit at your home, look for the outfit that model have, look for the colors that your location will have, and you're good. And that's how it puts together. So in terms of a color, you see the, it is triangle color scheme. We have greens of the dress. We have reds on the phone, on the sheets, and some wooden furniture within their place, and the blue walls. Overall, color scheme is kind of depressing because all colors are cool, and we feel that this is not so warm, not so positive image. Then the details, the story. As you can see, all the details kind of crossed and scattered around the uh, image. So like white dress behind our model shows, showing that something bright left behind. For example, bed for two, but she's sitting there alone. Phone that kind of reminds you that there is someone on the other side. Or the open door to the left, which kind of shows that there is the exit. So it may be the alternative of the kind of the story. And the overall styling, like the clothes and the interior, was picked to fit into 70s Soviet era. So again, I hope it was clear and interesting to see how I put it all together. Because uh, as I said, don't be afraid. Try, experiment, because only by that you will get the results that you want to, and you will put your stories together and bring them to life. Thank you so much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. And just some contacts in case you want to follow my works or maybe ask me a question. Actually, I'm quite accessible right here in the Tamron booth or right now in this scene. So you can free to, you're free to ask. First, let's give him a big round of applause. Maxim Guzenikov, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. When it comes to pictures, there's more than meets the eye. And I think this was a great example of how you can see how complex some pictures are actually put together, how much thought is yeah. put into it. And uh, thank you very much for, for taking your time. If you have any questions, give this Fragen here in Publikum. Wie gesagt, dann gerne jetzt. Ansonsten, Maxim steht ja auch noch, wie gesagt, in der Zeit lang hier bei uns. You're going to be here back tomorrow? Yeah, tomorrow in morgen the day gibt es übrigens tomorrow. dann auch noch mal eine weitere Präsentation übermorgen auch. Also äh, falls dann noch mal Zeit, äh, Sie Zeit haben, dann kommen Sie gerne noch mal vorbei und ansonsten jetzt einfach. So thank you very much, Maxim. Thank We're you. gonna take a quick break. Wir machen jetzt eine kleine Pause und sind dann um äh, 15:25 Uhr mit unserer nächsten Präsentation dann wieder hier am Start. Dann mit Oliver Güt zum Thema Sport und Lifestyle Fotografie. Big in Japan. Sehr sehr äh, schöne Bilder, die er da mitgebracht hat von seiner letzten Winterreise in Japan. Äh, tief verschneite Berge. Berglandschaften, Snowboard, Action, also da passiert einiges. Um 15.25 Uhr geht es hier weiter, aber bleiben Sie bei uns. Hier am Stand gibt es noch einiges zu entdecken. Thank you, Maxim. Thank you again. Thank you.